habari zenu karibuni sana hapa kwetu tunashukuru uja kwenu kulia pamoja nasi tunashukuru kwa upendo wenu kwa mtoto wetu Una, e, tunawakaribisha sana sana mimi ndio nimesimama kuongea kuhusu mambo ya wini maana nimetembea na he mimi ndio nilikwakea gipa and I'm also a cancer survivor of breast cancer survivor of 2015. So this journey, I know it very well. And I'm going to just talk to us about the journey, about her childhood, about her dreams, and the sickness, and then what the legacy will be for us. So in her childhood, Winnie was a peaceful person. She was a smart person. She was clean and organized more than I am. So that is my memory for her childhood. She started acting while she was in kindergarten at World of Life, and uh, she would memorize so much uh, scripts even at that early age. So her talent was really early tapped. Then the other thing about Winnie was, what you do not know, that she was bullied a lot because of her color. Because she was so dark, some people called her Sudanese, some people called her Chewsi, and she would cry when she was young. But having been brought up between five boys, those you saw there and some who are late, they had taught me to be a, a tomboy. So I knew how to fight and I taught her how to fight. The other part of Winnie that you saw that could fight, she was not born, by, uh, she was not born with it. It is me who taught her because she had to survive the bullies. And then the other thing that we realized when she was young, because of bullying, we bought her a, a, a toy or a dolly from Germany, which was so dark, which was so black. By then, we weren't having such, uh, such dollies. We only had blonde dollies. They were Zungu with blue eyes, with blonde hair. So we wanted her to know that being African is so, so nice. And it really helped her to do that, because out of that, she became confident in her skin. And then after that, after the, the, the bullying, now when she was adult, I'm going to talk to you when she became adult. She was a focused business person. She knew very well what she wanted to do. You know, like a parent would want someone to go to be employed, to get a salary. Immediately she graduated, she told me, Mom, I am not going to be employed. I'll not be employed. I am just going to work with my hands and I'm sure I'm going to make it because the employers pay you so little. Another thing was when she was uh, an adult, she made gifts. Because she was a talented person, she made uh, gift cards, she made uh, thank you cards, and she would spend them to give herself pocket money. And when they started Jukwa the band, she was among the uh, people who was branding it, and she really did well. She would sew her own clothes and sew the members' clothes, and she did not even go to the college for sewing. But at, her, at that age, she would still sew. She was, she was also uh, a furniture maker, and she would make furniture for a house, she would decorate her house, she was an interior designer. So this one child, I was gifted, I was blessed with one child, but out of that one child, she presented, she represented like 10. She represented like 10 of them together. And in her adulthood, she became aware that she was beautiful, and some of the things that stood out for her, or was her signature was the darkness. Each and every person who looked at her, they loved her darkness. So the dark girls that are here, please don't bleach. And if you are bleached, you can turn back. <laughs> we will love you just the way you are. Another thing that she had was very special was her eyes. She had a very beautiful eyes. And another thing that was an asset that became a liability at the end of it, because she couldn't let it go, was her breast. As you have seen in her pictures, she had this beautiful big breast. And telling her just to, uh, to cut it, was a very difficult thing for her to come to term to. So as Winnie was a performing artist, she loved 
in her dream, she wanted to become a star. So all along she worked, even with the, you got the band, she told them, let us not chase the fame. Let, let the fame chase us. So they just presented themselves, they will present themselves as a, a what can I say, a professional band. Can you imagine presenting yourself as a professional band? By then people want to have, to become stars. So out of that, because they branded themselves well, they were able to be hired by companies like the likes of Safaricom, and they would really pay them well, because they presented themselves as professionals. Her highest achievement was the leader uh, series, where she played the leader role. She said that she didn't like the role in the beginning, but the role gave her mileage. We thank you, the media people. We thank you, Lulu, for having given her that chance. People loved the character of Dida, and it was almost her character, because she was exactly like that. Whatever she acted, you wouldn't separate the Winnie and Dida. The two of them was one. Another thing that she did was, uh, she was very creative, and we used to fight sometimes, because she'll come and turn over my house and throw away things, then she would tell me, this is too old, let, let it go, and me, I'll hold on to it. I don't know what troubles the creative. They don't want to do something over and over. She will come and she'll just look for trouble to trouble herself by doing and redoing it and rebranding it. So I came to know that the disorder that she had was called, in her DNA was called creativity. So for the people or the parents who are here with children who are creative, just let them be themselves. Do not force them to become doctors. Do not force them to become engineers. Just let them be what they are. Her motto was kindness. She was very kind to each and everyone. She treated each and everyone with respect. Even her house manager is here. I tried to tell her to remain in the house to keep the house for me. And she was crying and lobbing around. Hey, Nyanya, why do you want me to remain? Ah, me, I want to go. I want to go and see my, my, my uh, Adidida off. So she really loved people and she related well with each and everyone. Even the border border guys, they took to guys, they still call me, they gave me contributions, they still condole with me, her friends are here. She would relate with each and everyone in your capacity, at your level. So I'm going to talk about uh, her legacy. Uh, no, whatever she achieved, the, the 31 things she worked with the uh, ST Cla Claudia, yeah, ST Lauda. They worked together with ST Lauda and the National Company, a beauty company, to run the 31 days. They had reached to her while we were in Turkey that she does the same again this year, but it was never to be. So, her other work that she did was uh, carrying on the cancer uh, awareness. Not so many people uh, have gone through cancer and say about it. It's like a taboo kind of, it's, it's very rare. Even I came to know later, some of my aunties or some of my cousins and my relatives are here, they had gone through the journey and yet they, I had not known at all. But out of that, they became aware, they started talking about it, they started encouraging her, thank you so much for that. So she has this uh, legacy that she's leaving behind that I'm going to carry. And this legacy is about the foundation. You have had people here who have said that, uh, that foundation we are going to carry out. We have started the first phase by paying for people who are cancer sufferers, the NHIF. Because by paying for one NHIF who is not able, you are able to take that person through mileage of about maybe 8K moles and other tests should be covered. So she was paying for people, the NHIF cover, just to, uh, to, 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 to give a hand back to the society. So she had started a, a, a documentary for taking care of the cancer patients. We were to make awareness, the family members, the caretakers, what it takes to be a caretaker. As for me now, I have been a caretaker and I have been a cancer survivor. So I know that journey very well and I'm going to carry out that legacy. We are going to complete the work that she has started hand in hand with the people uh, of the foundation. I'll be there for you fully because I understand the journey as a caretaker and I understand the journey as a, a, a survivor. 
So in her sickness, I'm going to talk about her sickness. She had a cyst in her breast when she was about 14 years, and uh, it got us worried. After being tested, it was found to be benign. And then we stayed for a long time again. We, it was still there. We went. We were going to Aga Khan Hospital. They tested again. It was still there, and it was benign. And then they said, no, it will get. It she. It will. She will. It will disappear maybe when she gets children or when she grows up. But it never went away. At a certain point, she was worried because it kept growing. So during the corona time, is the time that she realized, around that period, that all was not well. Because she would get her periods and be in pain, and that the, in the breast. So until after the periods, then the pain would go away. So it became so bad, at a certain point, that it never went away. That's when she went for tests, and it was confirmed that it was cancer. So at that particular time, she didn't want each and everyone to know about it. She said that she doesn't want pity parties because people would bring her down. She wanted to be positive, she wanted to be focused so that she can get well faster. So she became public about the same thing after about one year. And uh, that's when you people knew. What she did not know that she had been suffering for a long time. So she started her treatment at the Post General Cancer Center, where we have uh, facilities nowadays. She did eight rounds of chemo. Thereafter, she was put in uh, on uh, oral therapy for about six rounds, and nothing much changed. So that's when we came to you people, telling you that we want to we want you people to support us. We want you to work with us, and you are really uh, helpful. You came through for us and you enabled us to go to Turkey, where we were given treatment. She got nine rounds of, nine rounds of chemo again, and then she was still put on uh, oral therapy because cancer had not cleared in every part of her body. By the time we went to Turkey, it, had, it was in brain, it, it was in the both breasts, it was in her lymphodes, it was in the lungs, it was in the stomach. So after the treatment in uh, Turkey, it had cleared from the lungs, it had cleared from the from the, the stomach and the brain, they did a, 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 what is this, cyber, cyber knife. So it kept it under control. But the other parts, when we came back, it started growing again. And then it, it, uh, it forced us to go back. So on the third month while we were here, because we had worked out, the cost of being there and coming back, the cost of coming back was lesser than the cost of staying over. That's why we, we came back. So she deteriorated it in the third month, and that is when she, left. she did her last video that you people came through for us, and we were able to go back immediately. So in Turkey, we did not have much time, because when we went there, she had really deteriorated, and the doctor told us the things are not looking good, but they are going to try their level best. So in that time, because I was working with her, I was encouraging her, I was a cancer survivor, I trusted God, I believed in God, and I trusted that God was going to heal her. So while we were going, uh, waiting for the treatment, she told me this one thing, that, uh, Mom, I have had a conversation with God. Then I said, what kind of conversation? She said, I have asked God that if he knows that I'm going to die, let me just die now. But if he knows that I'm going to get well, I am ready to hold on because I'm so much, I'm in so much pain. We wait until we get sick. We are not creating awareness. So I would want us or the government to put emphasis on the awareness as opposed to the treatment. And then another thing, while we were sick, while we were sick and we were visiting public hospitals, there are these concerns that I observed. The relationship between the doctor and the, cancer patient, and the cancer patient is not there. How? Because one doctor is attending to 16 to 20 people a day, meaning that when you go there, you will not have a continuity of relationship with your doctor. So every time we went to see the doctor, they asked Winnie, oh, which, which treatment were you given? Because they have these so many files waiting on their desk, they are not even able to go through it. So it was, they depended on what Winnie told them, 
I have had uh, maybe a round of cycle of this and this. Then I was asking myself, what about the people who do not know what they were treated on? What about the people who do not know how to read or how to write? So what will the doctor do? But then, that was that. Apart from that, the, these three doctors have private clinics. So imagine a doctor coming in at 8 and leaving at 2 to go to their private hospital and handling 16 to 20 people. What kind of service would you expect out of such an, a service? It means there's a, a disconnect. So my solution there is let the government, let the government uh, pay the doctors well and let the government ban the doctors from having private clinics while they are still working. Of whom, whom are they working for? It is us. Why are, why are they getting their, um, our money and not giving us the best? And the government is aware, the government sees it. So this, this place where we go for treatment is the place they get their, their patients to go to their private hospitals, those who can afford it. And it's not a good thing. Those are the things that the foundation will have to address uh, uh, in regard with the government in relation with the, how cancer patients are treated. Another thing that I want all of us to be aware of is the process that we, we farm with. Because we farm with these fertilizers, some of the fertilizers have been banned in other countries and yet we are using them here. Then after the harvest, there's this uh, preservation the process that they do. They have some chemicals they put in the food, and this food ends in our body. So if your system is compromised, for sure, for sure, I can assure you, you are a candidate of that disease. You might be well now, even the, the farmers who are here, you are well. You don't know what will become of you in five years' time. You don't know what will become of your daughter, because the food that you produce, you don't eat the whole of it. You go and sell. The people who are trading in the business of food, the chemicals that you are using to preserve the food, know that it is ending somewhere. It might not be your daughter. It could be your daughter's uh, maybe child. So these things we have to be aware, all of us. We have to start working hand in hand. It is something that is so bad. You people, if you have never gone to a cancer place, just go and visit and see how many people are there. And that will be only one place. So I am sure that this will be addressed. And finally, I'm talking about the people who are given the mandate to take care of the processes. The people like caves and those kinds. Just to see that the production of food, the storage of food is done in a proper manner that will not destroy lives. So memories. I want to remember Winnie as a very creative girl. I want to remember her as a very positive person. I want to remember her as a very strong willed woman. Whatever she went through, I could not have gone through it myself. Because my process took so short, I, it was my, the cancer that I had was discovered in the first stage. So the treatment really took very short. And look at when it was discovered when it was late. She started the treatment when it was late and it took three whole years and took her life away. So please, please, please be aware of yourself, be cautious and stay healthy. So in, I just want to, re, to register my thanksgiving to all the people who have stood with us, to Mount Zion Deliverance Church Mombasa, to the media fraternity, and the others who have stood with us. I think that I leave to the chairperson who is going to give thanks. Thank you so much.